Okay, we're back uh, connecting globally. This is uh, Think Tech Global Connections. We have Michael Davis uh, on the line from India, and we are happy to talk to him both about India and also about Hong Kong, which is his specialty in Washington, where he serves as a member of the, what is it, Woodrow Wilson Institute? Did I get that right? The Woodrow Wilson International Center. I'm a fellow there and, and a fellow, at, I'm actually a senior scholar at Columbia University as well your research scholar. And you spent a lot of time in Hawaii, but also a lot more time, at least in your career life in, uh, in, in Hong Kong. And uh, we've talked many yeah. times about, uh, you know, what has been going on in Hong Kong. And it's so interesting. Yeah. Uh, this is the principal purpose of our show. It's so interesting to see that Hong Kong has gone from one crisis to another. And the second crisis completely swamps the first one. <laughs> I don't know if yeah. that's accurate. No, no, it, <laughs> it, it is indeed. It's something that uh, we've been trying to decipher and make sense out of. Yeah. Well, let's talk about India first, though, Michael. What are you doing there? Where are you? Um, and what are you finding? Yeah. And uh, let me ask also about Trump's visit while I'm asking. Yeah, well, I'm here because uh, we build a university here. I think you and I have talked about this before uh, called Jindal Global University. And I'm one of the founding board members and so on and been involved with it. It's 10 years old now. And I try to come once a year. This time I'm here for two months. I teach a course on international human rights. Now, India has been facing a lot of its own challenges in that regard. There's Modi, the current government of the BJP, has put through a bill uh, that tries to favor Hindus, actually. Uh, and the bill is called the Citizenship Amendment Act. And what it tries to do is say that people who come from adjoining states uh, fleeing some kind of repression, uh, they can acquire citizenship in India unless they're Muslims. <clears throat> and this is kind of deeply rooted in a story that's longer than we can talk about today. But it, when uh, in the state of Assam, when Bangladesh was formed in the 70s, the losers in a, in a war that created the country of Bangladesh had fled into the state of Assam and they, they lived there for many years without any proper documents. And the local Hindus were not too happy about their presence. They were Muslims. Uh, and so they were trying for years to find ways to push them out and, and deny them citizenship. And now with the BJP, a very Hindu-oriented party in power, they're trying to do uh, just that. And they're trying to do it nationwide in many other uh, policies they advance. And some of the critics accuse them of trying to be like Israel to create a Hindu state in India. And because the very foundations of the Indian constitution speak uh, of equality of peoples and a secular state, uh, it's, uh, it not only disturbs a lot of Muslims, of course, who are the targets of this, but also many of the, the majority, the Hindus, who value Indian status as a secular state are up in arms. And there've been massive protests in the state of Carroll, where I'll, I'll go later today, the protest, uh, they even formed a human chain across the entire state. So it is a very uh, disturbed situation. In the middle of all this, along came Donald Trump about a week ago. And Modi, of course, uh, wanted Donald Trump to be uh, happy, I guess, to have his ego fed. So he arranged a big uh, cricket stadium full of people, about 100,000 people, to receive Trump. This was some kind of a, a copy of the way Trump had taken Modi to Texas uh, to a demonstration. So these guys are, are in a sort of mutual uh, backslapping society trying to uh, uh, advance each other's egos. And they have some somewhat similar personalities in that they're populist and they play to the sort of religious right in their own countries. Uh, it doesn't sound all that good to me, you know, but I, I wanted to tell you about our, um, our uh, regular correspondent in Varanasi. He's a student there, and I asked him a couple of times, uh, what do you think about Trump? And he said, to my surprise, he said he likes Trump because Trump is powerful, strong. He's strong, that's the word. And so what, we, what I get here is uh, here's India, a democracy. It's been a democracy for a long time. In, 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 in population, it's the world's largest quote, democracy, end quote. And yet now we have a divisiveness going on among the religions. I wasn't aware that there was such a divisiveness to this extent before. 
where the government gets involved and tries to separate people, where there are protests and actually, uh, what, 10 or more people were killed already at these protests. Um, this is not the oh, sound yeah. of a democracy as we would wish it to be. What is happening? Which direction is India going? Well, you know, it's it's a kind of politics of division. Very, you know, it's funny that who teaches human rights here in India, I find the parallels with the United States are always stunning. And so in some ways, what Modi is doing in here in India has a similar kind of characteristic to Trump's wall and all this stuff about immigrants and so on. Uh, so the, and the ideas, even fighting over the Constitution's roots, uh, are, I think, uh, things that are going on in the U.S. as well. So, so this, uh, this is the kind of what's happening. And you're right to draw attention. There were riots where Hindus were beating up Muslims uh, in the district of Delhi, which is uh, nearby to where I'm at right now. Uh, and I think last I heard about nine had, people had died. So it's a serious situation. Yeah, it's really too bad. And, and it's, uh, I have to say, it changes my view of the place because I've always had this sort of soft spot for India. I've seen it, uh, you know, make great progressive strides over our lifetimes, uh, educational strides. I, I, would, I would keep that soft spot for I have a soft spot for India. That's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, and the people are just amazing. Uh, the students here, unlike uh, students where I taught in Hong Kong, Hong Kong is East Asia. The students tend to be quieter. The, I always say the, the struggle in Hong Kong is to get the students to speak up. The struggle in India is to shut them up. They just love <laughs> to perfect. engage <laughs> on the, in debate. And, and I, that gives me a lot of hope for Indian democracy, that uh, these students aren't pushovers. And of course, the Hong Kong students turned out not to be pushovers either, as we have seen over the last nine months. So uh, there, there is hope. And keep that soft spot. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I will. But you know, Michael, uh, we talked before the show about, you know, the nice places you want to visit in the world. And here we are besieged, literally besieged by coronavirus. And so you look at India, for example, and India really doesn't have a lot of cases. If it has any cases, it's, it's, it's on one hand, I think, as far as I've heard. And so you say, well, uh, gee, India presents as a, a pretty positive place to visit these days. And it's almost as if the coronavirus, which could be, become endemic, meaning permanent, a permanent condition of the yeah. species, um, the coronavirus and viruses like that um, sort of change the appeal of various places in the world. If you find a place that maybe you didn't like so much before, but now you find it doesn't have any virus, you say, hmm, that's a better place. I'd like to visit that place instead of the place that has a lot of virus. <laughs> so you know, the whole thing is being rebalanced. As you might imagine, as being here right now and facing the prospect at the end of March, returning to the U.S., I, I was, of course, hoping that there'd be no outbreak here and such that I would have trouble returning. Uh, and so far, so good. I tend to teach in Hong Kong in the fall. I'm not sure if that's going to be equally. So far, Hong Kong is only in a one, a CDC number one rating, not number three. So, yeah. so that that's a good news. But in India, I think it's only, it's worth noting. Uh, at least you know these viruses, as we know, SARS and others have evolved in China. It's often be, uh, thought to be because of these wild animals that are sold in markets and stuff uh, in a in China where you know, meat, exotic meats are valued. India, where one third of the population is vegetarian, has not historically had that kind of problem. And so uh, it's uh, less likely that an indigenous uh, uh, virus of this nature would arise. Mm -hmm. And then India's trade with China is much less. Uh, and so the Chinese aren't uh, going in large numbers to India. Although your comments suggest maybe maybe they will. <laughs> maybe they will be more problem. attractive. <laughs> well, let's yeah, turn to Hong right. Kong, Michael. Let's turn to Hong Kong because that yeah. you know that's an area yeah. where you've followed it closely uh, for years and years. And you know we we yeah. started um, a, a while ago talking about the umbrella movement and and uh, Carrie Lam and and the uh, the attempts by uh, Beijing to influence uh, the legislation and lives of the people in Hong Kong and 
And uh, gee whiz, I mean, there were people being shot on the street. It was, it was really troubling to see how a, what, what we'd all considered a very civilized place, a chip off the old UK block, uh, was you know, falling, yeah. falling into this uh, most depraved situation um, over, over the effects uh, of, of, the, of the PRC's efforts to contain it. But now, all that seems past. It all seems relegated to a lesser place on the priority list. Can you tell us, you know, what are the issues today in Hong Kong? What's the priorities? Yeah, well, you know, it's not past. I, I wish, you know, the problem had been solved politically, and it, we could say it was past. But what it, it subsided a bit. Uh, and yet, just this past weekend, there were uh, was an outbreak. Sort of, it seems now that the masses aren't turning out because people are concerned not to be collected in in large crowds. But some of the front, what are we called, front front liners, people in the front rows of of the protest, did turn out in the past weekend. I think 115 of them were arrested, uh, accused of. of you know, throwing Molotov cocktails and rocks and, and this and that kind of reminds you a bit of, of the West Bank. Uh, and so they there was an outbreak. And then uh, another tragic thing over the past week was that the government suddenly decided they wanted to arrest three very prominent uh, Hong Kong uh, political elites who are, are leaders in the society on the pan-democratic side. And that was Jimmy Lai, who's the publisher of the most popular Chinese language newspaper, the Apple Daily. Uh, he, he is, of course, very famous for supporting democracy. And during the Occupy movement five years ago, was in fact, one of the people camped out in the street. But he's a very wealthy man. And he uh, has donated lots of money also to the Democratic Party in Hong Kong. He's very close to the founding uh, leader of the Democratic Party, Martin Lee. So he was arrested and charged with an all unlawful assembly and also apparently assaulting a reporter from another paper that was harassing him. Uh, and then uh, two other guys, one is the former chairman of the Democratic Party, which is the leading Democratic Party in Hong Kong, uh, Yong Sung. Uh, and, and then a, a leader that I, you know, I did research, I'm writing a report on Hong Kong, and I had dinner with just very recently at Lei Chuk Yan, who's the head of, of one of the Hong Kong uh, uh, labor unions and also a prominent uh, Democrat. So, so they, I don't, they suddenly arresting them for what they did, participated in a quote unquote unlawful assembly uh, in August. Uh, so why they would take this step, I mean, this is this, this, what sometimes is so disturbing. It seems like the Hong Kong government is, is completely insensitive. Uh, to situations that arise in the society. Years ago, I think it was 15 years ago, when I was one of those involved in the Article 23 protest, and one of the leaders of it, in fact, I was debating the Secretary for Constitutional Affairs at that time in the Foreign Correspondence Club, and I was wearing a face mask, and I asked him, are you really going to push through these laws that, you know, on national security in the face of, of uh, this virus? And now they're again, they're back to the same business. They're arresting uh, people over their democracy protest in the face of a, you know, a real crisis uh, involving a virus. I want to like get your they, take they, on why. I want to get your take on why that's happened and what the mood is these days and how the coronavirus and all the trouble in, in mainland China is going to affect that is affecting it today. But first, let's take a short break, Michael. Uh, it's Michael Davis. Uh, he's in India talking about Hong Kong on a trip from Washington. Get all that? We'll be right back after this short break. <laughs> with Michael Davis here on Global Connections. Uh, so much to talk about, and we're focusing on Hong Kong for the moment. Um, so tell me why the Hong Kong government's uh, affected as it is 
by uh, the powers in Beijing is is renewing old arrests on the basis of unlawful assembly. What's going on? Uh, you know, it's, I don't know. They, they are just ham-fisted in how they handle politics. Uh, I mean, the whole protest shows that. I mean, Beijing is thought to be calling the shots. Beijing appointed a new guy in charge of uh, what's called the, the local liaison office in Hong Kong. Actually, it was, excuse me, they appointed a new guy in charge of the Hong Kong Macau Affairs Office and the liaison office, so the, the office in Beijing and the office in Hong Kong. And the guy in Beijing is thought to be a hardliner, specially selected to try to, you know, take care of the Hong Kong protest and get things under control. And so the only guess that I have is that he's trying to show that he's taking care of it. He's getting people that are thought to be troublemakers, uh, you know, and arresting them. So uh, that seems to be the case. You know, we, many of us have written and talked and done all the conjoling we can to say, you know, a lot of the problems in Hong Kong would go away if you guys would just go away and leave people alone. But that, that seems to be out of their uh, playbook. You know, one, of the, one thing is clear is it, it's not over. The unrest in Hong Kong is not over, and I'll bet you five that the, uh, Hong, the Hong Kong economy and its investment in the mainland and elsewhere is, has to be affected by all this um, uh, consternation. Yeah, it is, and I, I agree. It's, you know, we're doing, or I'm part of a group doing a report uh, that was funded by the National Democratic Institute in Washington, uh, another affiliation of mine, and Georgetown University. So we had a team to show up in Hong Kong in, in December. And our sense of it was even if things slowed down at this time, one time or another, uh, that, you know, if Beijing even succeeds in repressing the protest, unless they address the underlying problems, these protests and these, this public concern will keep coming back. Uh, it's not going to go away. Yeah. Uh, well, and there must be I, a relationship, Michael, a huge relationship between, call it unrest, call it mm, troubled times in Hong Kong and the coronavirus. Because, because uh, Beijing must be desperate about it. And if it's trying to exercise control in mainland China, maybe some of that, you know, need for control leaks over into its relationship with Connie Lam and, and, uh, and Hong Kong. But it seems to me Very anyway good. that the, the shadow of coronavirus must play, you know, a huge role in the public sentiment these days in Hong Kong. I, I can't show it to you now, but we had a, we had a, a movie uh, of people waiting on line to buy masks and the photographer could not find the end of the, the line. Uh, right. it, was a, it was a panic line. And, and people in Hong Kong must be very concerned about that. Uh, and they must feel, they must have feelings about whether China's doing a good job, whether Xi Jinping is repressing, uh, whether, you know, China is really stable anymore, uh, whether these the oppressive moves that we've heard about and, and seen on the internet are uh, outlandish, whether the attempts to control the disease in mainland China are working. Uh, and for that matter, whether attempts to contain the disease in Hong Kong are working. Well, you know, the, that's exactly right. The last point, I think, is the crucial one. I, I think Hong Kong people long ago had, had lost confidence that Beijing's way of running mainland China is, is going to be acceptable. But they, they, when this virus started arising, Hong Kong people were very much concerned. And now the corrupt government's handling of the coronavirus is added to the list of Hong Kong uh, objections to, to the way things are done. And so they, they're, you know, I, I would say this would further infuriate uh, when the protest over democracy resumed, because now there's just another uh, on the long list of objections to how things are done, how Beijing overrides and controls the Hong Kong government or how the Hong Kong government is over, overly cautious about how it deals with mainland China. So it was a bit slow on the uptake about blocking people from coming in. And you have to remember, Hong Kong was the epicenter of the SARS virus. 300 people died in Hong Kong out of the 800 or so worldwide. So Hong Kong uh, is very sensitive to this and that Carrie Lam wasn't uh, proactive in, in immediate in dealing with it, what was a problem 
And I think it, it is some part of the pile on, if you will, of how things may go down the road when, when the immediate crisis of the, of the coronavirus is, is diminished. Yeah, well, so you know, it seems to me that when you have a, a crisis of this nature and you have questions about whether the government is doing or can do the right thing and can contain the virus, not only in Hong Kong, but on mainland China, I mean, people must be very concerned I'm sure some people think, you know, the, the, their world is in jeopardy. Um, and that leads to questioning the relationship of the citizen and the citizen's government. And certainly it leads to questioning the relationship of Hong Kong and Beijing and leads to the relationship of, well, looking at the relationship of the people in China and their government, you know, whether they still have confidence in their government and whether, and this is a big question, whether there will be changes, changes in regime, changes in geopolitics, changes in large changes in public opinion, as affects the way the governments work in both of those places. Do you see that happening? Well, the, yeah, the impression I have on the Beijing side of this is that the government, in some cases, has proven more sensitive about its political capital than the virus. And so they first tried not to expose it, which is what they did with SARS as well. So, so the, the result is that they didn't jump in and start dealing with the problem in a timely manner. And now I've heard that they're even producing a book uh, on how she, well she, Xi Jinping has handled the crisis. So they're in a, a, a PR uh, in a, you know, mode at the moment. They're trying to push through a, a new, uh, uh, their version of how great it has been and how he's handled this crisis, where there's little chance that there will be some kind of assessment at the end of all of this of how well they did. The World Health Organization leader was in town there, and, and of course, they always say something nice to the country they're visiting, and that's the part that will get showcased in the local media in China and not the kinds of concerns and criticisms about how they stepped up and handled this or not uh, in, in the early phases and, and the tactics they're using, whether they're effective or not. It would be very important for the rest of the world, if we're stuck with this virus forever, to have a really close up look at how Beijing has handled it so they, people in other countries would know what tactics work and what don't, what, what is effective and what is not. Yeah, I, I, we've, you and I have shared the, uh, the column, most recent column by Frank Cheng, um, yes. covering this, covering this subject. It's, and it's very interesting that in, in, uh, along the line of priorities, uh, Xi Jinping has um, uh, focused on his diplomatic relations, his image in the world, um, his political success uh, or protection uh, to a higher degree, it seems, than he has to solving the problem. Um, I guess he really doesn't want to look bad. Uh, and what that tells me is that maybe if you strip all that off, he would look bad. It seems to me that he does look bad. Uh, when you stop the prop propaganda, you know, he hasn't done very well on this. And he's, he's, uh, he's I, certainly uh, re repressed a lot of people. Exactly. And, and to what extent, I mean, it's like that, sh that ship in, sorry, my... My Alexa is going wild here. No <laughs> it's like that ship in, in, in China, I mean, excuse me, in Japan, where they thought that they were protecting people by keeping them on board. But in fact, it seems that they made the things uh, worse, sort of like a petri dish uh, of the problem. So I, I, I don't know to what extent uh, the extreme measures the Beijing government took were effective uh, or whether they may have caused the problem to get worse. Well, we are certainly going to learn a lot. As you say, we're going to learn a lot from China when we, when we find out what, what happened. Uh, we're going to learn a lot from the experience in the U.S. when we find out what happened or didn't happen. I, I, I think Trump has made the same flip in, in uh, priorities. I mean, he's more important, it's more important to him to look good uh, than to actually do anything. I think the World Health Organization doesn't come out very well on this, uh, including its compliments to Xi Jinping. Um, but also it's, you know, inability to raise the money, raise the organi ra raise the cooperation level among all these countries. So right now it seems to be yeah. like pandemonium. Right now it seems to be disorganization on a global scale. Uh, and I, w w where do we look? 
what is going to happen on this year you know you're you're in touch with a lot of the elements here especially the the chinese part of it um this isn't going to go away right away uh we are going to see big changes emerge out of a long-term stress test which is what this is you know for for the species well you would think uh the u.s would play a leadership role because the cdc and the U.S. Uh, bodies that handle these kinds of things are generally uh, among the best in the world, and people look to them. They don't look typically to China to solve these problems and provide leadership on a global scale. And the Trump administration just hasn't been up to it. Apparently, the, the team in the White House is supposed to handle it was dismissed a long time ago. So uh, it's uh, been a problem. He, he showed up in India to meet 100,000 people, and apparently that was a more urgent concern than, than dealing with this. Now, I'm not to say the India visit wasn't important. I think everyone understands that the U.S. relationship with India is very important. But, but uh, you know, the coronavirus is more urgent at the moment. I'm always interested to, to hear what the doctors have to say. I mean, the ones who were not necessarily speaking to accommodate the administration. Uh, and I've seen a number of, uh, you know, missives, uh, emails and papers and what have you uh, from doctors who have worked with virus and worked with epidemics uh, over, the, over their, you know, professional careers. Uh, and they're, they're not optimistic at all. Um, and they're worried about a, a huge effect, much bigger than SARS or MERS or um, Ebola. And so uh, I guess, you know, really, ultimately, the question is how how global is this going to be? We know it's going to continue, but how global is it going to be? And maybe it's interesting, whatever is happening in India, that's, that's a lesson there somewhere. Whatever is happening outside yeah. of China and Hong Kong and Korea, we have a big problem. Um, that's a lesson there. Um, going forward, um, gee, I, I don't know where to live anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I think Hawaii will work, although I worry. Has there been any cases in Hawaii? I can ask you a question now, because I'm not aware of whether there has been. But uh, I worry when that arises, you know, because uh, the island is sort of isolated in, in some sense, how that will. Well, it's isolated, but we have plenty of traffic with Asia. We have uh, plenty of, um, you know, people coming uh, on a tourism on business, what have you, uh, from Asia. And I mean, if you just look at the likelihood, the logic of it, it's, it's, it's logical to assume there's a lot of people who have come here and who have, um, you know, laid down, shed the virus here. And, and the question, that's what I was wondering about. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is and an that... international place for sure. And the question is, yeah. why don't we have any cases? Um, you know, the last, uh, uh, expression by the, by the governor a couple of days ago was they they tested one person uh, for the um, I don't know where they got the test kit actually they tested one person <laughs> and and found that this person had the common cold that that why does that not give me any confidence the fact is that CDC uh, blew it on the first round of test kits and now we're waiting for the second round and if you you know look over the whole country you won't find a lot of test kits and if you look at Hawaii you won't find a lot of test kits. And so if we had a lot of test kits, don't you think from a logical point of view, we'd have much more virus than we now know about, yeah? So wait, get, well, we have to re, 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 recircle on this because if we talk again in a few days or a week, Michael, my answer will be different. Well, you know, if, if you find you need masks, I suggest India. There are lots of masks available here. <laughs> <laughs> So in your travels, and you travel everywhere, uh, what kind of uh, what kind of uh, protection are you availing yourself? What how have you changed your you know your health and hygiene habits uh, to deal with the risk? Well, I think the biggest thing, and, and they advise this, is to wash your hands regularly. Uh, apparently, we all, even my thinking of myself as I reach and touch my face uh, during the show. Uh, that we do that apparently a couple times every minute, uh, that humans just do that. So uh, having clean hands uh, it therefore becomes a critical uh, ingredient, uh, and that's what they're advising even here. Um, they So far, it's not been a problem here, but, but I think that's all, all we can do. 
you know, on airplanes. I haven't been running into it, uh, but then I don't know. I'm going on an airplane uh, later today. We'll see. <laughs> Will you be wearing a mask? Well, I have one. I'll probably stick it in my backpack because, you know, if there's no one wearing it, then you kind of draw attention to yourself. <laughs> it's probably not worth it. But if somebody starts sneezing and coughing beside me, then I'll whip it out. <laughs> well, Michael, it's great to follow your adventures. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's great to be able to talk to you. And I know that these, uh, these trends and phenomena that we've talked about are going to continue. And, and I would look forward, I am looking forward to the next time we regroup and compare notes again. In the meantime, I just want to say one thing, Michael, Michael Davis. It's been nice yeah. knowing you. Take Very care. nice knowing you too, Jay. And I look forward to actually doing this interview with my Aloha shirt on in Hawaii. But uh, that's for another episode. <laughs> Be well. Stay well. Okay. Take care. Thank Mike. you. Aloha.